these brothers and sisters in Christ who are part of the family of God, part of the, the body of Jesus here on earth. And I thank you for the beauty of the body, for all of the incredible people that I've already met this week, for the earnestness of their followership. I thank you, Lord, for so many who are on the way, who are already moving, who are growing, following Jesus, becoming like him. And Lord, I ask that many more will join us. I also pray that they, in their maturity process, will become incredibly attractive. And I pray that there will be, about this church, something that draws people from all quarters, from all places in life, from all financial uh, or economic strata, educational strata, across racial lines, people group lines, but Lord, may this church be a mix of the people that you are drawing to your son. And may this church be a magnet because more and more and more of these dear people are following Jesus with a whole heart. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, let me quickly review. This little diagram that, that we've been looking at is a picture of how we as human beings tend to to be independent. In fact, we're born this way. There's a, there's a self-centeredness about us. It turns often into selfishness. We like to be independent. We like to be self-sufficient. We like to do things our way. And the Bible calls that sin. In fact, it's the root of sin. Because of that, we do superficial sins. We do the, the uh, symptomatic sins. But all sin can be traced back to self-centeredness, rebellion, and the issues, the control issues of the ego or the heart. Now here's, here's three people on this screen. Each of them has encastled their heart. In other words, their guard is up. They are an entity into their own unto their own selves. They have uh, their own interior castle, their kingdom. And yet, each of these three people calls himself a Christian. All right, this guy says he has invited Jesus into his life. So in the throne room of his heart, this chair is a throne. What he's done is is not move off the throne. His, his own ego, his self, in control, is on the throne. He wants to go to heaven when he dies. And he would love to be released from guilt and shame for the bad things he's done and said. And in his mind, it's okay to have Jesus in his life. But he doesn't want Jesus in charge. He doesn't want to change that much. He sees Jesus taking over at the throne of his life as a threat. And in fact, that is not a welcome idea. He thinks if Jesus takes over, he will not like his life. He thinks he knows better how to run his life than Jesus. He thinks he'll have more fun in his life, more adventure, if he's calling the shots. And if Jesus takes over, why then, happy days are over. From then on, it's just religious duty, you know? Very, very common kind of an attitude. Here's a very busy lady. She calls herself a Christian. She is compartmentalized, as we all are. She's got all kinds of things going on in her life, and all these categories are balls that she's drunk juggling. She's trying to keep it all up in the air. She lives pedal to the metal. She lives in her car, delivering kids, you know, hither and yon to all kinds of activities. Um, she tries to do her best. She's, she's trying to be what everybody expects of her. And she's got Jesus in her life, 
but he's just a category. He is not at the center. She is still at the center because she's got to control all of this. This fast-paced, multi-option life that she has, uh, only she, from the center, can actually make this thing work, she thinks. So Jesus is the religious category. He's the spiritual category of her life. Her family, her finances, her fun, her friends, all of the other categories of her life that she feel, feels she should manage. And here's a guy back here who also calls himself a Christian. And what happened in his life is that at the control center, at the throne room of his heart, he's invited Jesus to take over. And he quite willingly says, I will serve you. You lead me, I'll follow. Now, which of these are practicing religion? They're all people who say they're born again. They're all people who say Jesus is in their life. The issue is who has invited Jesus to be Jesus, the God of the universe? Religion in our kind of churches can exist just like religion in other kinds of churches. Religion is always when you're in control and Jesus isn't. Then you're just religious. People who are living in the kingdom of God who are intrinsically uh, changing at the deepest levels of their heart are no longer religious. They are the people who have found the way life works, the way they were designed to live. They are finding out how to live under the reign of Christ. And this is not religion. It's health, it's completeness, it's wholeness, it's the way life should be lived. And it's not just a little side trip. It's not a little category of your life. It's your whole life. Because Jesus is in charge. So that's a review of where we've been. Now I want to take you to uh, the fact that when your life belongs to Jesus, and he's the leader, and you find a group of people who are headed in the same direction, you create irresistible community. Here are the outcomes of the gospel of the kingdom. The kingdom of self, which we've been talking about, uh, has people in it who are sick of it. They've tried everything. It has not been successful. They're not happy. They keep trying different things. They've tried drugs and alcohol. They've tried sex. They've tried all of the, the things the world says you need to do to have fun. And it, it isn't fun anymore. It's boring. And they're frustrated with their lives. And their dreams are dying or have died. And they look ahead in despair at their life. And at that point, some of them are willing to consider Jesus. <coughs> they basically show up saying, I need help. They may show up for counseling. They may show up for a recovery group or a support group and just say, I, I can't do it on my own. I, I need help. All right? That's wonderful. It's a, it's a step toward the cross. Then there's those who are at the, at the level of saying, oh, my goodness, have I messed up. I blew up my family. I destroyed my finances. Uh, I've destroyed my health. I am so sorry. Look at the mess I've made. Look at the people I've hurt. Look, look at the, the devastation I have wrought with my choices. And they're at the guilt and grief level. And they need forgiveness. But they don't need necessarily another chance. Now, 
we, all, we always say, and for good reason, that Jesus is the God of second chances, and he is. If he is allowed to be in control. In other words, if you want to try Jesus as a religious category, it ain't going to work. It's not going to change uh, the things that are wrong. Because what, what we're after in, in helping people to the cross and to the marvelous salvation that's been provided in Jesus Christ, what we're after is people who are hungry for leadership, who are at the point where they're realizing they've been in control and they have not done a good job of running things. All right, do you want Jesus to come in and take over in your life? Do you want a leader you can trust with the rest of your life? That is the kind of, that's at, it's at that level that salvation is powerful for this reason. What we want in new believers, of course, what God wants, what the Word of God talks about, is, is people who follow Jesus, who obey Jesus, right from the get-go, right from the start. You say, well, is that possible? I thought new believers have to be taught. You've got to give them follow-up. You've got to disciple them. Let me tell you some stories. At least one story. I have a, a friend who was a colleague for some years. When I first met him, he was just coming out of drugs and a life of promiscuity. He'd been in college. He had been a partier in college. He had just lived it up. And he finally said, what's going on? I am not happy. I'm, I'm not fulfilled. This isn't taking me anywhere. I'm going to get in trouble. He had just been in a bar fight uh, the night before he came to Christ. He was, he was disillusioned with going his own way. And when he came to Christ, it was lock, stock, and barrel. It was, here I am, 22 years old. You got me. I give up. You can have the rest of my life. And what happened was absolutely remarkable. Within a week, he had read through the New Testament. Nobody told him to read through the New Testament. In fact, I didn't meet him until two weeks after he came to Christ, and he'd already read through the New Testament. I didn't need to tell him to tell other people what had happened to him. He was telling everybody he knew. In fact, I had to help him not destroy the people he was talking to or destroy the relationship. I mean, he went home and he told his dad he was going to hell. And that's not a good thing to do, you know. I mean, your dad usually doesn't take that too kindly from his kid. Um, he, he talked to all, he had, he's from a uh, family of 10 kids. He talked to every one of his brothers and sisters about what had happened there. He talked to all of his partying buddies and friends, and they thought he was crazy. You're nuts. You're nuts. You got religion. As if he'd caught some sad disease. Um, but here's, here's what I'm saying. I had to run to keep up with him. He was obeying the Holy Spirit naturally, normally, because he had given control to the Holy Spirit right from the start. I didn't have to teach him that he needed to be hungry for God's Word. He was constantly hungry for God's Word. <coughs> Let me tell you about this guy. He, he read through the Bible five times the first year that he was a Christian. He has read through the Bible at least once every year since. He's hungry for the Word. He loves the Word. He feasts on the Word. It's an essential part of his life. I have never had to tell him to stop swearing after the first time that I told him. And this is how it happened. We were in a Sunday evening service, and uh, I opened it up for testimonies, for people to share what was going on in their lives. And, and he got up and he said, Jan, 
He actually, he called me Father Jan, because he was from a Catholic background. So Father Jan, that was a damn good sermon this morning. <laughs> Oh, you know how that went over in a Baptist church. <laughs> so I had to get with him afterwards and say, you know, there's some things that you have to be a little bit careful about saying. And, well, what kind of words? You know? Well, let me just suggest a few that probably you don't use in the church, at least. You know? So we made a list, but it never, never happened again. I didn't have to tell him to hate sin. He started having an aversion to sin right away. I didn't have to tell him to love other Christians. He wanted to be there every time the doors opened. He loved to be in the services. He loved to be talking to people. He loved his new friends in Christ. And I didn't have to tell him to witness. He was doing it constantly. He brought more people to our church than all the rest of the people put together until he ran out of friends. <laughs> what am I saying? I am just simply saying this. That's a normal conversion. If the person surrenders to Jesus. If they only accept Jesus as a ticket to heaven, as a way of getting their sins forgiven, getting out from, from under their guilt, then you got to then you got to teach them everything step by step by step until you get them to the point of surrender. Let me tell you this. If you, have, if you have a new convert in your life and they are totally dependent on your elbow grease, on your effort, on your initiative, something's radically wrong with the new life that supposedly they have. Because when the Holy Spirit is released in a human life, he cannot be contained. He does wonderful, powerful, life-transforming things automatically. Because he's God. He really is. So following turns into this love relationship, turns into reliability. This young man was quickly rising in terms of leadership. Within uh, about five months, he was teaching the college class. Not because he was the smartest person there, not because he had the most Bible knowledge, but because he was living what he knew. And therefore, everybody was listening to him. Wow. You really mean you do this? Yeah. I don't just study it. I practice it. And so he was teaching others. Why is this so important? It's because transformation can only happen as a result of surrender to the leadership of Jesus. And Jesus expedites his leadership through the Holy Spirit. Mark and I were talking about this, uh, I think this morning, we were, we were talking about the fact that Jesus has identified with the human race forever. He has taken upon himself a human body, which he is in. He lives in it. Now it's a glorified body. We don't know exactly all of what that means, but we know that that body with Jesus inhabiting it is at the right hand of the Father. So when you say Jesus is in my heart, that's not exactly true. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. Who is it that's in your heart? The Holy Spirit. He is the agent of Jesus. He is the one who is the manager that Jesus has sent to follow through on your surrender to him. He is after transformation. He wants you and I to be like Jesus, and so you got to be yielded to him in order to change and grow into the image of Christ. That's why this is so important. Now, what will happen if I yield to Jesus? What results come from a life of repentance? Not just the event of repentance, a whole lifestyle of repentance. What, what will happen? The way we love is primarily, uh, is the biggest part of what changes. The kingdom of self, that kingdom we all are born in and hang on to until we surrender to Jesus. 
In that kingdom, love centers on self. So I thought that was healthy. I thought we're supposed to love it, to love ourselves. If love centers on my desires, my pleasure, my happiness, my control, my success, and my needs, I am a very difficult person to live with. A self-absorbed, self-focused, self-centered, selfish person is a very painful person to be around. In fact, I think self-centeredness and selfishness is the essence of hell. This is what hell's going to be like. If you like being a self-centered, selfish person and putting yourself first, if you like being a taker instead of a giver, then you will have an opportunity to live with people like yourself for all eternity. And it will be incredibly painful. It's already painful on this planet, isn't it? I mean, you get, you get two self-centered, selfish people together and they marry each other. What have you got? Pain. They are going to make each other utterly miserable. Because they're always going to be demanding and clawing and drawing and trying to get the other person to meet their needs. You're my husband because you're supposed to make me happy. You're my wife because you're supposed to make me happy. And a me-centered life is an ugly life, and it's a life that causes great pain to other people. In the kingdom of God, love centers on God. Now this, just follow me here because I know your eyes could glaze over right here. His desires, his pleasure, his happiness, his control, his success, and the highest good of the other creatures in his universe. This is what Jesus meant when he said, if you wrap up the law and the prophets, the whole of the Old Testament, you can put it in a nutshell, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. Alright, that's exactly this. If you love God first, instead of yourself, He will always turn you outward to loving others. Inevitably. So, this happens because there is a door. We've talked about that door. This portal that God has opened into his kingdom through Jesus, through the grace that he offered in Christ. Repentant faith results in a life of forgiveness, no question. God does forgive us. He does cleanse us of our sins. He does justify us. He does redeem us. But he takes over. The cross, remember, always is about leadership before it's about <clears throat> grace. In other words, what you access through grace is not just forgiveness. What you access through the grace and love of God is God's leadership. He becomes God to you. And that changes everything. <clears throat> he takes over. So, the biblical contrast uh, the words that the Bible uses for this are the flesh and the spirit. So the kingdom of self represents the flesh side of things. And here's the, uh, the list. Unfaithfulness, fickleness, betrayal, promise breaking, desertion, selfish interests, unreliable, untrustworthy. Why? Because the person is always going to head back toward themselves. Their own personal interests. The flesh is always like this. It always acts like this. Now let me ask you this. If you had a choice, and here's the, the contrast, this is what the life of the Spirit produces. Faithfulness, steadfastness, loyalty, promise keeping, fidelity. It operates in others' best interests. It's reliable and trustworthy. Which list would you rather be married to? Which kind of child or teenager would you like? Mm -hmm. 
you're not any smarter than God. God is looking for children, for followers, for citizens of his kingdom, who represent that right-hand side of the, the kingdom of God lives, the Spirit. This is what the Spirit produces in us, a kind of faithfulness that God loves, rather than the unfaithfulness that God hates. Again, repentant faith takes you from one side to the other. Please listen. If you say you have been to the cross, if you say you are a Christian, if you say Jesus Christ is your Savior and Lord, then there must be movement from the flesh to the Spirit. Because he takes, when he takes over, he begins to produce what the Spirit of God has to produce. And that is a beautiful, beautiful thing. Now the church health implications are these. If you, if you are in a church, and most of us have been in more than one by now. If you're a brand new Christian, wonderful. This is probably your first church experience. And uh, you're, you're in for a good one here. But a lot of us have been through several churches, or at least two, and um, a lot of us have had bad church experiences. We've had disappointing church experiences. And this is why, if within a church, for whatever reason, there is a significant group of the people, particularly the leaders, who are avoiding God's leadership, in other words, they're very religious, they're very involved, they attend, but God is not leading. He is not in control of their lives. What happens next is very predictable. That kind of a church will be relationally toxic. Uh, the environment will be toxic. It'll be uh, an accident waiting to happen, a war waiting to start. And all you have to do is to have a, a disagreement. Start a building program. Change the worship. You know, something that's controversial, have a fundraiser. Something that gets everybody, you know, interested and, and commenting. And What happens next is, is, uh, is predictable as anything you can imagine. The egocentric elements of the church start showing up. There's a competition, there's conflict, there's a breakdown in relationship, and there is inevitable side-taking or alienation. Now let me ask you this. Do you think Jesus likes that? I think he hates it. He loves the bride, he loves the church, he loves his children, but he hates this kind of toxic relationship stuff. And yet, that's what we're known for in our evangelical Bible teaching churches. We are so off the wall when it comes to the way we do church. In so many places, almost every church that I'm acquainted with, and I've spoken at many, many churches, have had their share of fights. Very rarely do I run into a church that has not split, or where there aren't two sides to the church. There's a group of people who sit over here on this side, there's a group of people who sit over here on this side, they don't talk to each other, there's offenses. My friends, that is one of the the, the worst possible things we could do in terms of letting the world know that it doesn't work. That Christianity doesn't really change much, if anything. It changes some activities you do. But it doesn't change your heart. You're still just as nasty as ever. You're still just as willing to duke it out. You're just as competitive as ever. You want to win at the expense of other people losing. You think you're more right than everybody else. You, you think you're superior, your mind is superior, your education is superior, and therefore you treat other people with contempt, as if they're children. 
and respect is gone, and honor is gone. And my friends, if I can leave you with anything, it would be with a, a disgust for that. You do not have to be a church that fights, ever. You say, well, what about theology? I have never been in a church fight. I, for 10 years, I did church conflict management. In other words, I was invited into church messes to try to keep the two part, you know, sides from killing each other. The nastiest job I've ever done. It was horrendous. But the message that I, I have for churches all across the country is just simply this. You don't have to do that. Under the leadership of Jesus Christ, under the control of the Holy Spirit, a church can be a harbor. It can be a place of peace, safety, harmony. It can be a refuge. It can be trustworthy when it comes to relationships. And the one thing I know is that God blesses safe churches. He pours out His grace on safe churches. People flock to safe churches. They sense it. They taste it once they're here. They want more of it. They want to be part of it. Because it's a little bit of heaven. It's what you were made for. And your soul is satisfied when you find that kind of a group of people. So, I'm just challenging. Don't ever let yourself, for any reason, drift toward the toxic environment. I was about to say this. In all of my days of uh, dozens and dozens of church conflicts, trying to mitigate and, and be a consultant and a mediator, um, almost every church said they had theology problems. In other words, somebody was right and somebody was wrong about some point of theology. In all the time I worked with those kinds of churches, I never found one church where that was true. It was always about personalities. It was always about dominant people clashing. I want my way. I want my way. And theology is just ammunition in that kind of a situation. For what it's worth. In the kingdom of God, when a group of people let God lead, it creates a relationally healthy environment. What, what was the formula we read in, in 2 Peter 1? If you have the divine promises, you know God has given you everything you need to develop into Christ's likeness. There's a process that goes on. You apply yourself. You give it everything you've got. You apply all diligence. You're in it. You're cooperating with the Holy Spirit. And He adds... And where does, where does that addition process take you? To love. Every time. Not just once in a while. Not just for some people. Everybody, all the time. If you let God have His way, it will lead you to love others rather than to love yourself. You'll be Christ-centered. You'll serve. You'll love harmony. You'll build relationships. And the hallmark of a church like that is oneness, togetherness, teamwork, and it's an amazing power for God when that happens. There are very few churches like that. One of the saddest things about the evangelical movement is that we are so fractured. 36 different kinds of Baptists. It's not because we need 36 different kinds of Baptists. It's because we've divided that often. And even within those 36 different kinds, there's subgroups who don't see eye to eye with their own, with their own strata. I'd like to talk to you about Galatians 5, 22 and 23. You all know this one. But let, let's turn to Galatians 5, okay? Galatians 5, 22 and 23.
But the fruit of the Spirit, the, before that, there's a whole list of the works of the flesh. And I've already <coughs> summarized those for you. The works of the flesh, verse 19. The battle between the flesh and the Spirit, verses 16 to 18. But in verse 22, it says this, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now let me just talk to you about this. The fruit of the Spirit does not need a perfect environment. Now some of you are fruit growers. Uh, you live in a fruit producing area of the world, uh, certainly of this state. You know what it is to grow apples and uh, cherries. What else do you grow around here? Asparagus, asparagus. Plums, peaches, pears. Asparagus isn't a fruit, come on. <laughs> peaches, pears. Anything else? Plums. Plums. Cherries. Okay. Cherries. Apples. Lots of different kinds of apples. Somebody else say something else? Strawberries. Strawberries. Oh, that's one of my favorites. Blueberries. 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 All right. Uh, fruit is a fantastic thing. One of the things that is uh, in vogue out on the West Coast, I don't know if you, you ladies do that here, but uh, when you're having guests over uh, or you've got company, it's uh, kind of the norm for there to be a basket of fruit out on the counter. Is that around here too? People do that? Put a basket of fruit out and it's just, it looks good for, for one thing, but it's a really nutritious snack. And you know, you're welcoming your guests to take something healthy instead of a bowl of candy or something like that. The fruit of the spirit is like that it's refreshing but it, it happens in an adverse environment these brown things are not pretzels they're worms okay get that now you see the eye on the end toward the root i know it's not a real accurate worm but uh, it's okay but you notice what i named these worms Persecution, adversity, suffering, difficulties, sickness, limitations, fatigue, imperfection, spiritual warfare, injustice, frustrations, problems, sin. You could add some more. The fruit of the Spirit always is produced in a hostile environment. It's always the case. It's not, you, you, you don't wait for all the conditions to be perfect before you you start producing the fruit of the Spirit. These wonderful qualities that we just read about, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, that can happen in the worst of conditions. And it's no excuse if you're being persecuted, if you're sick, if you're tired, if you are uh, been unjustly accused, if you've got a serious financial problem, it's no excuse to not produce the fruit of the Spirit. Because the fruit of the Spirit operates in a hostile environment. Let me just talk to you a little bit about how attractive this is, all right? Charm and I um, have had the habit of practicing hospitality. Somewhat like your pastor. I mean, I, I love being in, in uh, Mark and Dorothy's home. It's been a sweet place. It's a place of peace. Um, they're great hosts and hostesses. Charm and I try to do that. We try to live uh, with open hands and let other people share what we have. When uh, the Goodwill Games in the early 90s were held in Seattle, we, we uh, heard the plea from the, uh, the City Fathers for people to open their homes because there were students coming from all over the world who didn't have money, uh, couldn't afford the prices in the Northwest, and if they were not going to be in a tent city or whatever, they'd have to be in homes. So they, they asked us to open our, our homes. So we did. We had a young man from Kiev in the Ukraine uh, come and stay with us. His name was, was Nikolai, and uh, he was a very bright young man, third year at the university. Uh, Kiev, 
and uh, he had come for the Goodwill Games. And we uh, had a little hard time. His English wasn't real good, you know, and we had a hard time at first communicating, but we worked at it, he worked at it. We got better at it as the days went by. He was with us for about a week. And we, we sat down with him and said, let's make a list of the things you want to see while you're here with us. Uh, so we did, and, and we, you know, we, Mount Rainier, uh, there's a Snoqualmie Falls, is this majestic falls on the Snoqualmie River. Uh, there's downtown Seattle with Pike Place Market. And there's, we, we wanted to take him over to Bremerton on the ferry and back at sunset, you know, and have him see the glory of the mountains and the sound and so forth. And uh, we had all of these things we wanted to show him. And uh, we made this list out. And, and uh, finally he said, I don't mean to be a bad guest, but I don't really want to see these things. And we said, okay, what do you want to see? He said, I want to see your stores. Now you got to remember that this was a time in the Soviet Union and its satellite countries when everything had melted down financially. This was just before the collapse of the Soviet Empire. There was nothing in their stores. We took him to a, a Fred Meyer Superstore. And out our way, that's, you know, you groceries on one end and then everything all the way to hardware and gardening on the other. And it, you know, it takes up about five acres. It's just a huge, huge building. And uh, so we started at the grocery end and we walked in and he had his camera around his neck. And uh, we walked into the produce section, you know, in those big supermarkets. The produce section is at least as big as this room. And there's all these rows of bins with all of the fruit and vegetables. And, and he stopped, sat down his, his uh, backpack, and pulled out his camera and started taking pictures. And he used up a whole roll just in the produce section. By the time we were through with Fred Meyer, he used up about 10 rolls. And we said, what are you doing? He said, they'll never believe this back home. He was so astonished and impressed and in awe of all of the stuff that's available here. My friends, I think that that's what should happen when somebody walks into one of our churches. It should be like walking into the produce section of a superstar. <clears throat> they should go, oh my goodness. <laughs> Look at the beauty of this fruit. Look at the abundance of fruit. I'm not sure there are very many churches that would provoke that kind of reaction. I don't think there are too many churches of which visitors would say, I gotta take some pictures. Because nobody's going to believe this bag all. But I think that's what God wants. I think God wants to show us off. I really do. I think when he sees his children walking in obedience, becoming like his son, he has no greater joy than to show us off, to put us on display, and to say, this is what I'm looking for. This is what I will produce if you let me into your life. If, if you let me be your God, I will make you the kind of people that you love to be around. At our church in uh, Seattle, in the North Shore, this is in our, this little diagram is in our uh, Constitution. I argued until we got it in. <laughs> I didn't have to argue for it. I just said, this is so central to who we are. Let's just put it in our Constitution and bylaws. So we did. And uh, the two passages, of course, are the love passages. The command, Jesus said, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you, John 13, 34, and 35. And then John 15, 9 through 17, again, if you love me, keep my commandments, my commandment. 
our, my commandment is to love one another. So what we did was this. We defined the target, uh, what, who we were and what we were shooting at, with the Word of God. We said, okay, the Bible de determines who we are. The Bible determines what we believe. This is the truth. That is the circumference of the target. Everything within the Word of God is going to be within that circle, that outer circle. That's, we're going to operate with right doctrine. We're going to do our best to discern the Word, preach the Word, teach the Word, live the Word. The second ring is the, the right behavior. You, you always teach for change. You teach God's Word expecting God's power, expecting God's Spirit to produce life change. Not just to know it in your head, to accumulate it in your memory, but to live it, to become the essence of the truth. But the bullseye, the heart of the target, is right relationship. That's what 2 Peter 1 says. Remember 1 Corinthians 13? What do we call it? The love chapter. What does it say is the greatest thing? Love. You know what uh, 1 Timothy says? The goal of our instruction Chapter 1, verse 5. The goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart. It's hard to miss because the, the Word of God is so clear about it. <coughs> that, my friends, is safe community. If you want to be that kind of a church, if you insist on being that kind of a church, if God's called you and He has to be that kind of a church, and one of the things that will happen is you will find yourself feeling safe with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Your guard will not have to be up. You'll not have to be suspicious and always reading between the lines and saying, I wonder what she meant by that or I wonder what he meant by that. You've come home. This is the kingdom. This is what heaven is like. We're on display. God Himself is at work in us. We are becoming beautiful. We are something else. There's nothing like us Amen. on the planet. <clears throat> so back to the cross. What if that's not been the case? What if uh, sin has had its way? What if relational disaster and self in control and independence and rebellion against God's authority and self-government and the kingdom of self in control, what if that's been the norm in your life? One thing I know about it, about you, is that you'll be disillusioned and you'll be suspicious of any church and you'll have your guard up. We do not want to duplicate this. We do not want to multiply this. That is not who we are in Christ. We have repented. In faith, we have come to Jesus Christ and said, I want access to your love and forgiveness for all eternity. I, I accept the gift of your incredible grace. And I do so on my knees. You are my leader as well as my forgiver. When that happens, Christ's government comes, there's a submission to God's authority, there's a dependence, God is in control, and that is what sanctification is, if you like theological words. Now let me just say something about this phrase, or the, the, those words, Christ's humility and submission. Most of us don't, do not think about the fact that Jesus Christ is humble and that what he did at the cross was submit to the Father and, strangely enough, to us. When he asks you to humble yourself and submit to him, he has already shown you an example of that. The example. The humblest being in the universe, my friends, is God. The humblest being in the universe. He is not an egotist. 
He is not self-centered. He is not a taker. He is a giver. When Jesus was on the cross, he was basically saying, this is what God is like. I am taking your place. I am dying in your place. I am taking the consequences of your sin. I have humbled myself even unto death. Remember Philippians 2? He humbled himself even unto death, even the death of the cross. Such submission, such sacrificial love. And all he asks you to do is meet him at the cross and say, uh, and, and humble yourself to his humility and submit to his submission. He's, he's gone as far as he can to make it possible for proud people like you and I to get there. He is not at the cross the dictator, the tyrant, the domineering God of the universe who has to have his way and wants to force everybody into his mold. He is at the cross saying, meet me at the place where you are least threatened in your insecurity. Meet me at the cross and there you'll find me humble You'll find me the servant of all. You'll find me the sacrifice for sin. You'll find me absolutely in love with you. To the point where I'll give up my own life. That's why That's why I submit to him. That's why surrender is a sweet word. Repentance is a sweet word. Humility is a sweet word. Because that's who he is. That's what he invites me into. My friends, please hear me. God loves you so much. He wants you to be all that you can be. He wants you to enjoy your life. He wants you to be fulfilled, satisfied. He is not going to take your life from you. He's going to fulfill it. He's going to make it good, the best. Please don't get your guard up against him. The God of Calvary is the God of the throne. So please don't be afraid to serve him. Would you pray with me? <laughs> it may be that there is someone here tonight who has not yet seen Jesus in his humility and submission at the cross and said, I will humble myself to his humility and I will submit to his submission. I can't believe the beauty, the breathtaking beauty of such a Savior. I can see how I can follow him. He's not bossy. He's not pushy. He's not a bully. He's not demanding. He's a giver. Why wouldn't I want to follow him? Why wouldn't I want to give him my life, the rest of my life? He deserves it. And I will never be satisfied apart from him. Mm -hmm. If you haven't ever done it, would you just open your heart to him tonight? to say, Jesus, come in. Come into the, the very center of my being and take your place on the throne of my heart. 
The control center of my life is yours. I want you to be my leader. You can have the rest of my life. I know it's the best decision I'll ever make. And I'll follow through. This isn't just a one-night decision for me. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep on letting you lead for the rest of my life. And then, friends, if you have made that kind of commitment, would you join with these brothers and sisters, these wonderful people around you, who are in an ever-increasing way reflecting the glory of the Lord, would you join them and grow with them and love them and let them love you? And would you be a safe church whose reputation will spread beyond the borders of this county, beyond the borders of this state, beyond the borders of this country? You can't keep a beautiful church hidden. God puts you on display. <laughs> He loves to show off his children when they're walking in love. Lord Jesus, I ask that your glory would come down here. That, that you would exercise your power here. Not only in reaching lost people, but in changing the people who are reached, who become your followers, into the beauty of the Lord Jesus, filled with the fruit of the Spirit, a safe community, attractive, lovely, the very community that everybody out there is in their heart of hearts longing for but doesn't believe exists. Lord, may this be one of those outposts of heaven a true kingdom community. And may you be seen here, lifted up, beautiful, wonderful, a worthy leader. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen.